I'd like to bring to order the San Rafael City Council meeting for Monday, July 6, 2015. Let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We met in closed session with regard to item 2A, and I'll ask the City Attorney if there were any reportable actions. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No reportable action was taken in closed session, and I also wish to announce since we held a closed session following our regular meeting on June 1st concerning 750 Grand Avenue that no reportable action occurred during that closed session as well. And thank you for doing so. We'll now turn to an open time for public to address us on any items that are not on this evening's agenda that uh, you, you would care to. And we'll start with Sue. Good evening. Well, glad to have you with us. Yes, please. Now, if you could, and just give your name for the, uh, the cameras. Hi. My name is Sue Carlamagno, and this is Julie Jaley. Hi. Hi. And um, we just are here for two reasons. One, to thank you, Mr. Phillips, Mayor Phillips, and the entire uh, city council and staff for all the help and work you do to help Italian Street Painting Marin. And it's just heartfelt from us. And I also wanted to introduce Julie, Thanks. who is our program director. And I'm going more into an advisory role and dealing with the artistic elements some. And Julie is going to be the face that you're going to see around a lot. So, Julie. So I just want to say I'm thrilled to be part of the team and look forward to working with you. Thank you so much for your support. Well, thank you, Julie. And, and Sue, thank you so much uh, for all the years, not just this past year. When, fortunately, I was on the great race and missed the event. But was uh, it? it was great. It was really good. <laughs> but I did miss uh, uh, the uh, annual event. And uh, I understand it was just a, a smash. As per usual, and so thank, uh, thanks to you and, and certainly to Joe as well. Uh, and we look forward to working with Julie and, and obviously the team. And you too. will enjoy working with No you. doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Well, thanks for making San Rafael special uh, on that particular thank day you. as well as others. Thanks. We couldn't have done it without your help. Well, the city you. does more for this event than any other city in the world does for their events. So well, and we're, no we're pleased to do so, and uh, let's talk about next year. All right. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, thank thanks again. Anyone else wish to address us on items that are not on tonight's agenda? Michael. How are you? Good. Hopefully the speaker's on. Um, I just want to say. Identify yourself, Michael. I apologize. Michael McIntosh. I live in San Rafael. Thank you. Thank you. And the reason I'm coming tonight is it's very easy from the outside, as I do quite frequently, to criticize those actions we don't like, especially when we're one not doing them. Tonight, I'd really like to praise Gary Phillips and the reason why is he's been the only politician that has truly overtly come out and tried to assist with the problems and loss of our Marin History Museum. Mm -hmm. Gary has actually mm -hmm. taken a very forward role. He's been very polite and considerate to all parties, trying to just get people to come to the table and have a conversation. People have not taken up his very gracious offer, which is disappointing. But to actually have a politician these days publicly state their opinion represent their constituents, it is a rare thing. It's something that if you look at it outside of the context of this particular conversation, it's a compliment that I would like to give every politician. So I came tonight to just say, Gary, thank you very much. Michael, thank you. Thanks for the comment. <laughs> Caught me a little by surprise. Um, I hope the paper got you quote, uh, your quote. If not, maybe you could provide the IJ. <laughs> okay. It's uh, nice of you to say that, Michael. There's a lot more to do, and if anybody has done uh, anything um, uh, comparable, I, I don't know who has with regard to you, to Michael and stepping up and, and uh, demonstrating your your advocacy. So thank you for doing doing that. Anybody else? In which case we will close and turn to the consent calendar. It's been requested that we hold item 3B and also 3G. And does anyone wish to have any other items? Uh, no. Anyone from the public wish to address us on any of the items that are listed under the consent calendar? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Council Mayor and Council. That was quick. <laughs> Let's give him another half a second. What do you say? 
My name is Kevin Haggerty. I'm with the Point St. Pedro Road Coalition, and I'm here tonight um, we, to tell you that we, the coalition had some questions regarding the Point St. Pedro Median Landscaping Assessment District Annual Report, and um, we've, and instead of delaying this item tonight, because I know you need to move it forward, um, the Director of Public Works has agreed to, to meet with our group to answer our questions and so that when, when the item, a similar item or the assessment item comes back in two weeks, we, we should have the answers we need in terms of formulating an opinion on that. So again, thank you. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Kevin, Kevin, thank you very much. Anyone else with regard to the consent items? In which case we'll move to, um, let's take the items held first, item 3B. Yeah, we need there's... to, to we need first? to approve the remainder. You of want the to do the others? Okay, either way is fine. Yes. Is there a motion with regard to all items except for B and G? So moved. And second. Moved and second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Matter carries. Aye. The matter carries four zero. Chief. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members and city staff and the public who are here to hear about our wonderful event that we're having next Monday in downtown. This is that your uh, council agenda items a street closure, but it's actually so much more. Uh, we are honored to be able to be one of 119 cities or towns throughout the United States and Canada who are hosting a Flame of Hope Special Olympics final leg relay portion for the Special Olympic athletes and the law enforcement representatives from throughout the world who will be running through our downtown, ending up at the plaza to have a uh, speech by the mayor, short speech, <laughs> and a uh, short speech by short me. Short run, as, long speech. Uh, sure. Well, I think it's the opposite. Uh, in, so basically, the World uh, Summer Olympics for Special Olympics athletes is at the, starts at the Los Angeles Coliseum on the 25th of July. 7,000 athletes, 28 different sporting events. And we are honored to be able to be one of the uh, host agencies, basically, to, to welcome this run. There's going to be 88, if I said this already, I apologize, 88 uh, law enforcement officers that were hand chosen from throughout the world and 10 Special Olympic athletes as well. So uh, Brian Auger has been working really hard with my Sergeant Todd Berenger to have a couple of bands who will be starting a free concert at 6.30 on the plaza. And also, um, we will be having the street line with uh, police and fire vehicles to welcome the athletes. This is a really, really uh, big event for the athletes, and, and I'm just hoping that the public can come out. The actual ceremony itself will start at about 9 o'clock. They're coming from Novato, mm -hmm. and they will be staying in our, in our city that night and moving on to Point South. So I welcome everyone to come out and celebrate the athletes and their accomplishments and show them that San Rafael can do it right. And that's it. And thanks for doing so. That's exciting. It'll be fun. It'll be great fun and uh, certainly respectful. So thanks for uh, our part, our participation and your involvement. Any Thank questions you. or comments? I think Andrew said he would like to run in the race, but uh, <laughs> he can try. Okay. Can watch. Um, is there then a motion with regard to the resolution? I'd be happy to um, move that we approve this resolution 3B. Second. Moon second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. Matter carries 4 0. Thanks, Chief. And now turning to G, resolution amending the existing agreement, California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways. To allow train, city, San Rafael uh, Fire Department personnel to operate the police vessel. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. One of the items on the agenda before you is an amendment to the agreement uh, with the Department of Boating and Waterways. The police department has a 22-foot rescue boat that we received in 2012 through a grant with the uh, Department of Boating and Waterways. The boat's been primarily used for the police department rescue operations on the bay. We recognize the importance of being able to include the fire department in that to have additional resources and increase our ability to, to help the community on the bay. There was some resistance from the state uh, finally this year they were able to uh, or we were able to convince them that it was the right thing to do so they've agreed to allow trained firefighters to operate the boat when there's uh, no police personnel available. Uh, this is a great partnership with the fire department. It's going to increase our ability to respond to emergencies, to life-saving activities on the bay. Uh, the more people we have trained, the more availability there is, the more likelihood that we're able to deploy the boat in an emergency situation. 
help provide better service to our community and eventually hopefully save uh, to save some lives on the bay. So we look forward to this opportunity to work with the fire department uh, and look forward to making this partnership successful. Thanks for doing so, working together. I think that's uh, that's that's wonderful. It Absolutely. really sends a good signal and, and the cooperation and uh, collaboration of effort is, uh, is outstanding. Uh, one more time, it's demonstrated. Any questions? I just, uh, Please. Just a brief question. It wasn't yeah. clear from the staff report, but maybe it's obvious. Is the reason why we need to amend the existing agreement with state parks is because they were the original grant source for this boat and thereby they control how it's used? That's exactly right. The State Department of, or, uh, Department of Boating and Waterways, they are 100% uh, boating enforcement and safety on the base, so they don't really have a fire department component. Uh, so this is really a rare exception that they're making. I think there's probably only one or two other departments that they've made this exception for. So it was really to accommodate them and to make sure that there was clear guidelines regarding how the boat was being used. Thanks. Any others? Motion? Uh, move that we pass item 3G. Second. Move and second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. Matter carries 4 0. Thanks again. Convey our appreciation to the, the rest of the troops. Let's move on to other agenda items. Item 4A resolution approving and authorizing the mayor to execute the city's response to 2014 15. Marin County Grand Jury Report entitled Pension Enhancement, Case of Government Code Violation and a lack of transparency. Is there a staff report? Uh, thank you. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, members of the public. Our office received the grand jury report and I reviewed it and immediately concluded that the best course of action would be for our office not to be involved with any legal analysis on this matter as it affected the city and its pension plan, uh, but rather to seek uh, independent counsel. And so uh, we are very fortunate that Michael Colantuno uh, was available and willing to help. And uh, Michael is present here tonight. He authored a legal opinion that is attached to uh, your written staff report. and. Um, is here to summarize that and answer any questions that you might have this evening. Welcome, Mr. Colantino, and thanks for uh, assisting us in this matter. My pleasure. There we go. There My we pleasure. Go. I'm happy to be here. The grand jury in Marin has raised concerns about your and three other agencies' implementation of pension enhancements in the early 2000s. The questions they raised have been asked throughout the state involving uh, similar pension enhancements uh, by other agencies. The statute that they're uh, citing has a number of details that are being looked at very closely in light of the experience of the stock market and the experience we've had with the pension benefits that were awarded. We've looked at these problems for other cities. We have looked at the conclusions that were reached by the Independent Council advising um, Southern Marin Fire Authority and the county. And there is a consensus among the public lawyers who've looked at this that the opportunity the grand jury thought might exist to unload from the city's shoulders the burden of the pension enhancements granted a decade ago is not the opportunity that was perceived. There are a number of reasons for that. First is there are essentially two requirements to the statute. One is that before you grant a pension enhancement, you get an actuarial analysis of its cost and you share that cost with the decision makers. The city did that. The city did that in the, in the, in the way that the law required it. The second uh, requirement is that that be made publicly available at a city council meeting two weeks before the pension enhancement is granted. And the cost of the pension enhancement is supposed to be isolated. There are two defects in your compliance some nine years ago. One is that you granted the pension enhancements to six units on six separate occasions. Each bargaining unit was bargained independently. You reached the conclusion with each bargaining unit on a different date. The very first of those actions was taken with less than two weeks notice of the actuarial document. All of the other actions were taken later on the same actuarial reports, therefore there was sufficient notice. So you were a little short on the two weeks requirement on one of the contracts nine years ago. The other minor defect we perceive in your compliance with the statute is that your staff reports 
reported the total cost of the new memorandum of understanding with the bargaining unit, which included the old pension costs plus the enhancement. They did not isolate the cost of the enhancement, although the actuarial reports that were made available to the city council did. In our judgment, you have substantially complied with what the law required of you. It was not perfect compliance, but it was substantial compliance, and that is often sufficient in public life. Secondly, even if you had failed, completely and utterly failed to comply with the statute, in our judgment, the law provides no consequence for that failure. It's not that we don't strive for failure, but that when the legislature defines a duty, they define the consequences of failing to fulfill it. And if they define no consequence, then the, the legal category that duty falls into is something that's directory, meaning you're directed to do it. It's not mandatory, because there's no penalty for failing to do so. So in our judgment, this statute is not a mandatory shall. It's a directory shall, but it does say shall. Even if it were such that you could set aside the pension awards for this defect nine years later, notwithstanding the fact that your entire workforce has planned their professional lives and their personal commitments in light of these contracts for a decade, we believe that you would not be able to make the change. One is there is a, a doctrine of law called vested rights, that when you make a commitment to your employees and they rely on that commitment by not leaving or not retiring, um, that you can't change your mind. And secondly, there's a doctrine called estoppel, which is uncommonly applied against public agencies, but under facts like these it is. If you make a representation with the intention that somebody rely on it, and they in fact rely on it, you can't pull the rug out from under them later. So we do not believe that you were perfect in your compliance with the statute, neither were any of your peers, but we do believe you substantially complied with the statute and that the consequences of your failure is to do better the next time but not to change the commitment you've made to your employees over the course of the last nine years. With that summary, I would be happy to answer any questions the council might have. And thanks for the summary. Questions, please? Yeah. Sure, if I could. Sure. Um, addressing the other communities that have faced this, that is where either grand juries or other third parties have questioned uh, compliance with the government code years ago and local jurisdictions have done the same kind of analysis that you've done on our behalf. Uh, have any of them come to a different conclusion, meaning that specifically that because the conduct taken by the jurisdiction was in some measure defective, that the rights aren't in fact vested, that the municipality is not in fact stopped, and that the deal can be unwound? The short answer is no. There's a slightly longer answer you might find helpful. One is that there is a case involving the legislature's failure to comply with the actuarial requirement itself and several other requirements. And there's a published case that says under those circumstances when the legislature refused to go forward with the deal, the unions couldn't enforce it because it hadn't been made in the way the law required. That case mentions in passing Government Code Section 7507, which is the statute that applies to local governments that we're discussing. Those who wish there were a way out here, as quick and as simple as the grand jury's report suggested, want to read that case, the California State Law Enforcement Association case, as standing for the proposition that 7507 can be the success for local government that it was for the legislature, but that is not my view and that is not the view of any other public lawyer that I'm aware of. I should also point out that because of our experience as a people um, over the last 15 years, there have been many efforts to draw back on post-retirement benefits, and that has produced a whole lot of litigation that's gone to the Ninth Circuit, it's gone to the California Supreme Court. There are many cases out there. The California Supreme Court decided in a case called the Retired Employees Association of Orange County versus County of Orange, the REOC case, a lovely acronym that. Um, they decided in that case that it is possible for employees to assert a vested right without a writing that demonstrates it. Usually contracts against public officials, against public agencies, against the taxpayers, have to be in writing. You can't get oral promises against the people. You only get written promises against the people. But the California Supreme Court said that in the labor and employment context, on the right facts, maintaining a policy over time vests you to continue it. So there's a lot of litigation out there. And in some cases, on some facts, some of the treatment of retirees has been found to be not vested. 
So an example would be you negotiate a, uh, a match on medical uh, premiums for your workforce. And historically, you have also given that same, let's say it's 485 a month per family. You give that same benefit to your retirees. But you have no written obligation to give it to your retirees. You've just been doing it. Some cases say you're vested because of the course and uh, pattern of conduct. Some cases say it was discretionary and understood to be so. So there's a lot of litigation out there, and public agencies have nibbled at the edges on some of their treatment of their retirees. But nobody has undone a three at 50. If I could follow that question with another. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> a local organization here that oversees uh, pension compliance, CSPP, uh, has engaged the services of an attorney who shared with us a very thoughtful, lengthy analysis, her analysis, uh, of the uh, grand jury report and, um, uh, and how we should proceed here. Have you had a chance to review that, and are you persuaded uh, by any of its points? Ms. Thumb was able to respond on very short notice over the holiday weekend for the same reason that I was able to respond on somewhat longer notice. She and I litigated these issues last year in the city of Pacific Grove where her clients had proposed an initiative that purported to find that the town had failed to comply with 7507 and to declare that the consequence was that the pension was void and to direct the city to claw the money back from the retirees. The city, um, after receiving from advice from me, filed a lawsuit asking the court to relieve the council from their duty to place that question on the ballot because the city believed the question was unconstitutional. And after about a year's worth of litigation, the Monterey Superior Court did in fact declare that that initiative was unconstitutional because 7507 was not mandatory but rather a directory and that the pension rights had vested. Ms. Thumb's clients chose not to appeal. I have reviewed her letter. Um, there are a few authorities that she cites that I can put in an updated version of my memo to you, just to tick them off fairly quickly. The Voters for Responsible Retirement case is, we, in our view, much narrower than she presents it to you and doesn't change our conclusion. I have addressed to you orally the REOC, or Retired Employees of Orange County case. She also suggests that there's a debt limit problem um, that should have voided your pensions. The problem, there are two problems with that theory. One is there's a case that squarely says it's wrong, a relatively recent case from the fourth district down in Orange County. Secondly, the logic of that case would make any pension system a debt. We have language in our Constitution that was placed there in, in the Great Depression after a lot of local governments had trouble paying their debts. Um, when the dollar gets more, when you have deflation, it's very hard to pay your debts because you're paying with more expensive dollars for less expensive dollars you'd pre uh, previously borrowed. The debt limitation says that you cannot incur a debt to be paid more than a year from now without a vote of the people. Yet we do all sorts of things that commit money more than a year from now. We buy copiers on leases. We sign leases on buildings. We do all sorts of things without voter approval. The courts have fashioned, for better or worse, it's the law. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just describing it. A number of exceptions to the duty to seek voter approval of debts. One of those exceptions is if the benefit you, the government receives in a year and the burden it experiences in the year balance, then you have no debt, even though you and I know we have debt. And so that theory has allowed pension systems. I don't wish to speak disrespectfully of the courts, and I don't wish to suggest that cynicism is appropriate. However, judges get pensions, and pension cases are litigated in front of judges. Judges, many of whom took a significant cut in pay to take that career, committed to that career, and made commitments at home about what that would mean to their, their dependents. So we should not be surprised that our legal culture and our legal system is respectful of those commitments. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'd like to focus more on our current compliance and our, our more recent compliance. So in, in your professional opinion, is the city of San Rafael now complying with Section 7507? And I guess, in, so, should I say, since in the last eight years have we been in compliance? So other than that aberration, if, I'm, if I could. I, 7507 I is triggered when you grant a pension enhancement. Mm -hmm. You haven't done that, neither has anyone else, and it's not likely. So it's a moot, a moot question? It's, it's an important question, should we ever find ourselves in the pension enhancement business again? But I don't think anybody expects that we will be. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a, a few things, so bear, bear with Please. me here. Um, 
the I notice a, a lot has been most made here, not only with our response, but listening to the Board of Supervisors' response that they've received, and a lot has paid attention to the word shall mm -hmm. and what the definition is. So I spent a lot of time over the last four or five days researching the word shall. And there is a website, plainlanguage.gov, um, which helps with formatting government documents that basically says, first, lawyers regularly misuse it to mean something other than has a duty to. Second, as it relates to the first, it breeds litigation. There are 76 pages in words and phrases, a legal reference that summarizes the hundreds of cases interpreting the word shall. So I can understand we're, we're not alone trying to understand what the definition of shall means. H however, we also in, in um, CSPP's attorney's um, response, they noted that um, San Rafael City Code, uh, I wanted you to respond to that. Code 1.08.110 says shall is mandatory mm -hmm. and may means per permissive. So in our own code, were we in violation of that? Your code draws the usual distinction between the things you must do and the things that you may do. But the law requires a further distinction among the things you must do. And those are those things which the law creates a consequence for your failure. And those things which the only remedy for your failure is a writ directing you to stop failing. That's the distinction between mandatory and directory. M mandatory laws and directory laws are all obligatory. They're all shalls. They're all something you have no discretion for. But some of them have a legally provided remedy, and some of them are simply enforced by a court order to go do it. This action, 7507, could be enforced in mandate. So that if you ever had a pension enhancement on the council agenda in the future and had failed to do these things, a court could order you to do these things before you granted the pension enhancement. But if you grant the pension enhancement without jumping through these hoops, there is no consequence provided by the legislature for your doing so. The legislature made that choice. We can question why they made it, but made it they did. So we're interpreting what was made in 1977 when most legal documents were used we're using the word shall. As I have read, it's taught in legal writing in law school, and so everybody was doing that. So we're interpreting that to mean that the senator who drafted that said, eh, we, ha we don't have to necessarily comply because there is no consequence for it. We're just going to put it out there. You have to do it, but if you don't, that doesn't invalidate your action. That's the way to think about it. And it's not an old problem. We still write statutes and argue today about whether the statute we passed yesterday was intended to be enforced by the courts with a remedy or whether it's simply your duty that you're expected to fulfill without a remedy. So by, by doing that, you're saying that we shall and we should have done it. Then shouldn't our response be to that question from the grand jury that we weren't in compliance? rather than saying we were substantially compliant. Because technically, if we were supposed to do it, even though there's not a penalty, we didn't do it. So shouldn't we respond that we didn't do it? I, th I stand by the memo as I wrote it, because it details precisely those things we did and those things we didn't do. I render my opinion about the significance of the things we didn't do, but I'm stating the facts, and the grand jurors are fully capable of viewing those facts differently than I do. Nevertheless, as a lawyer, you're entitled to the benefit of my judgment about the meaning of those facts, and I've offered it to you as my opinion. Okay. I, have, I have one more on another topic in there regarding the actuarial reports. And you put in, you put in there that these actual reports, the last one that was done was in 2001 and 2002, and that you stated that using those reports in 2006 would not be unreasonable. I have a hard time understanding that. I, I would ask anybody, would, would anybody be reasonable to rely on financial information four years in the past to making a future decision on something that's going to impact for the long term? In a, in a sense, would the city be, would be okay with taking our 2016 budget and basing that on revenue and that we earned four years ago? And I would say that's not reasonable. Mm -hmm. Things change. Obviously, things changed a lot in that period. I did research just on, just on the returns from the, the, 2001, uh, the 2001 actual report to the first uh, enhancement that we did in 2002. And the S&P 500 dropped 25 percent during that period, during that one-year period. So had we had a more recent actual report that might, whether or not it changed anything in what the city council done, I, I'm not going to speak to that. 
But the fact that you put in here that it's not unreasonable to rely on a report four years old, I, I really have an issue with that. And you're entitled to. But let me give you this perspective. There is a difference between the things that you wish to advocate as elected leaders of this city, the things that you think are good public policy and good stewardship of financial resources. And there are those things the law will do something about if you don't do. There's a big difference between good governance that we, achieve, we aspire to and that you aspire to and governance that's so bad that the courts will do something about it. And the reason there's so much room there is because we live in a democracy in which we want elected people like you to make the decisions and not appointed people like judges to make decisions for you. So I'm, a, I'm observing as a matter of law that action was within the range of reason, within the range of discretion entrusted to you. Now you may think that discretion was exercised wrong and, if you, and you can and should tell your constituents so. I'm just observing the range of discretion that the law affords you. I'm not an actuary and I don't even play one on TV, uh, but I do spend a fair amount of time talking to them and trying to understand what they do. And what they'll tell you, I believe they'll tell you if you choose to ask them, although their rate is probably double mine and they're harder to schedule. Um, that's because they like math, those of us who didn't went to law school. Um, what actuaries will tell you is that the purpose of 7507 and laws like it is not to enrich actuaries. The purpose of it is to enrich your decision making, to make your decision making fully informed. So you received, I'm going to find it, one, two, three, four actuarial opinions regarding uh, two pension formulas that ultimately were applied to six units. And you paid what one pays to obtain an actuary's opinion. Whenever you act on an actuary's opinion, one of the questions you ask yourself is, is it sufficiently fresh that I should rely on it, or should I get another one? And when you get another one, it's a little bit like, should I accept the value of my house for purposes of taking out a home mortgage, or should I get a new appraisal on it? There's a cost and there's a benefit. And how much the cost justifies the benefit turns on the circumstances that you find yourself in. Yes, there were four years in 2002 through 2006, but it was not one of those periods in which we saw major changes in the market. There was neither a major bull nor a, nor a major um, bear market. Secondly, actuaries will tell you that their work accounts for future bull and bear markets. They look over a long range, and while they certainly are affected by where in the curve you start, they purport to look over a very long range and to, and to average those things out. The, the last thing I would, I would say to you is you bargained with your units effectively for a citywide pension system with the safety version and the non-safety version. Your firefighters saw every other safety unit but them get that contract. They were four years late in getting that contract for reasons that had to do with the bargaining with them. Had the city chosen to isolate them and say everybody in our system is getting a safety pension at the three at 50 and you're getting the worst one, you would have had a labor crisis with that unit. Now maybe in hindsight we wish we'd had that crisis so that we wouldn't have the crisis we have now. But in the context of that time, knowing what your predecessors knew then, I don't think it was legally unreasonable to give the last unit the deal that had been cut with every other unit based on actuarials that, while four years old, were still current in terms of the market. But you don't have to agree with that judgment, and, it, and, and you don't need to aspire to that standard to accept my legal opinion that it was within the range of discretion that your predecessors were charged with. Thank you. And, and just one clarifying piece that, that I read here, maybe it's just a typo. Um, on Section 3 in your report, the city secured actual reports for full compliance with government code. <clears throat> you stated that the April 30, 2001 actual report estimated annual cost. And then it said that for the City of Santa Fe Policeman Management Association on October 21, 2002, by nearly six months. Should that be by nearly 18 months and not six months? Uh, you're looking at it more closely than I am, so I'll accept your word for it, but that sounds like a typo. Okay. And Ms. Sum did observe that we dropped the word public from a quote from a statute. She's right, we did. It was a typo, and we will add it to the final version of the memo. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to open public comment. There may be some uh, questions or, or observations that uh, might best be directed to you, and so I would ask you to uh, bear with us. And shall I make a note of those and then answer them when the public comment is Would, done? Please. I'll be happy to. Nancy, are you satisfied with that? Yeah, okay. 
We'll open uh, public comment with regard to this item. Good sure. evening, council members and Mayor Phillips. This is the first time I've spoken before a town council, so it's kind of exciting. Actually, I get the impression that all of you have read Margaret Thumb's letter, so I don't have to, I really wouldn't have had to give this speech at all. But after hearing your attorney, your outside attorney, I, sorry, I can't remember the name, I think that it's mandatory to put the real meanings of the codes on the record. Here is a list of our major concerns, which are fully described in Margaret Thumb's letter. Number one, Government Code 7507 and its equivalents, 31515.5 and 31516 are mandatory. Several cases have found this to be so. No cases have found it not to be so. Because they were violated, although they were mandatory, the public has suffered harm. Number two, disclosure of financial costs. Because future annual dollar costs were not disclosed each for each uh, benefit increase, the requirements of Code 7507 were not met. Number three, code, Government Code 7507 requires two weeks public notice of cost, and because the public did not receive the required notice, the San Rafael City Council did not meet the requirements for Code 7507. Number four, the constitutional debt limit was violated with the new pension benefits. Therefore, the proposed response should be rejected. Number five, financial impact. Because the financial impact was not disclosed, the public has suffered tremendous harm. Number six, the definition of shall. I was very, very entertained by his interpretation, which made it sound like it was an iffy thing. The California Code, Government Code Section 14 and City of San Rafael Code Section 1.08.120 both state that shall is mandatory. I guess I don't have time for the thank, other seven. Thank you for your comments. Oh, thank you. Number seven. Oh, no, I'm oh sorry. you said no? Yeah. Wrap it up if you would, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, number seven is the definition of substantial compliance or substantially complied. The memorandum from your outside attorney uses the phrases strict compliance and substantial compliance, thus the claim that there was substantial compliance is an admission that there was not strict compliance as required by law. And I'll Thank you. Rest. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Bob Breyer. I'm the president of the Marin Professional Firefighters. And I stand before you tonight in support of the resolution before you. Um, <clears throat> If you, um, if you look at the resolution and it's been vetted, well vetted by your outside attorney, which several of the other agencies, the three other being Southern Marin, Novato, and Marin County, have had their counsel or outside counsel look at it as per request from the CFP, CSPP group. And they've come down with a decision not too unlike what your uh, counsel has, um, given different situations that you have in San Rafael that he looked at, obviously. Um, having said that, the three of the MSERA depart or agencies that were affected by the um, grand jury report have all responded. Three of the four to date have been a similar response that your attorney has provided the information for yours. So I, I, again, I stand in support of the resolution, and I hope that the council will uh, pass the uh, resolution unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Uh, my name is Don Kreider. I'm a resident of San Rafael. And although I'm retired now, I was a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. And in answer to Mr. Gamlin's question, I cannot ever conceive of a pension actuary who did a pension valuation report saying, just use it. It's only four years old. Thank you. Next, next please. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is David Brown, and I'm going to ask in advance for about an extra minute or two um, since we have so few speakers tonight. But if not, I'll just pass the balance of my remarks on to someone else. Why don't we do that, staying with precedence? Okay. Um, first thing I want to address real quickly is this question of the actuary reports being stale or not stale. 7507 not only requires that percentage amounts be included in the actuary reports, but actual dollar amounts. 
And it is inconceivable to me that someone could take a, a position that over the course of 18 months or five years, the dollar amounts involved do not change because the number of employees change, um, their ages change, and their salaries change. And that's why 7507 requires that every actuary report, when done, calculate future annual costs expressed in dollars. Secondly, regarding uh, Ms. Thumb and Mr. Colantano in Pacific Grove, he made the point that she didn't appeal, and it sounded when he said it like, you know, damn, I lost. I better not appeal. In fact, they ran out of money. They would have been very, very anxious to repeal. Thirdly, regarding 7507, again, and the shall versus may nature of it, Mr. Colantano in his memo quotes from the city of Santa Monica versus Gonzalez, but he doesn't complete the quote. And in the, the, the court ruling, what the court said was, if the procedure is essential to promote the statutory design, it is mandatory and noncompliance has an invalidating effect. Well, two weeks' notice was the whole point of 7507, so the public could have a chance to think about and opine on whether pension increases were granted, and this seems to not matter at all to, to Mr. Colantano. Anyway, to my prepared remarks. Good evening, council members. Uh, tonight you are asked to approve the city's response to the grand jury report on pension enhancements. You are not asked whether the challenged benefits are vested, and you are not asked to invalidate them, though eventually that may become an issue. Very much akin to our adversarial judicial process, what you have before you are essentially two legal briefs. Can I have 30 seconds? Yes. One from your city manager and your outside law firm, CHW, and one from CSPP and its counsel, Margaret Thume. The briefs disagree in many ways, whether Code Section 7507 is mandatory or directory, whether substantial as compared to strict compliance is adequate, whether actuarial reports must be current and expressed in dollar terms, or whether older reports expressed in percentages are sufficient. Essentially, the memo from CHW says, while the city didn't follow the law completely, it followed it just enough, just enough of that law that it can get by, and that is all that is required. On the other hand, the memo from Margaret Thume says, in order to legally grant benefit enhancements, the city was required to fully comply with the law. This it did not do. You can handle this one of two ways. You can say that the attorney for the city wrote a memo, that's what the city paid him for, and that is what we are sticking with. Report approved, thank you and good night. You can do that right now. Or you can take a more deliberative, even judicial approach. You can carefully compare the arguments presented in the two memos to see which is more compelling and which makes a better case under the law. Then you can decide to send the response back to the city manager to be rewritten to reflect your conclusions. This you cannot do this If evening. you could, David. It will take too long. I'll let someone else finish. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paul Primo. I live in Mill Valley, and I'm a member of CSPP's core group. To continue where Mr. Brown concluded, for this you will need an extension from the grand jury, but these are routinely granted if proper cause is shown. I know this from having been on the grand jury as a four-person pro tem. Whichever way you choose is very important. There are tens of millions of dollars at stake. <clears throat> you will have to balance the needs of the citizens of San Rafael against the wishes of San Rafael's public employees. You will have to balance the financial impact of the challenge pensions against the consequent crowding out of services for public safety, mental health, care of children, the elderly, and the homeless. And most difficult of all, you will have to balance the law against the politics. You are all bright people. One of you is an attorney, one a judge. Three of you, two of you here have financial backgrounds. None of you is a professional politician who relies on the next election to feed your family. Please take your time. Get this right. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, please. Anyone else? Yes, Michael. Michael Mack. OK, Michael McIntosh. Um, the compliment that I was giving you earlier, this is another place that I really feel that our elected politicians can really stand up. And I realize it's hard because as a politician, your first job is really to make sure that you have your seat the next time around. So I appreciate that. And this is important enough and passionate enough for you guys you want to be here. I also think that our department as a separate entity is probably the best agency we have that represents the best of all people. 
But I do think that our politicians are at a point where we do need to kind of lead. If we look at Greece and things going around us, we are probably looking at very difficult times ahead of us. And outside of, as the attorneys over here, maybe you skated by, there's still something called in the spirit of the law. And sometimes we can't really have the foresight at the time that we might have today, whether or not we had the actuarial reports at that time to really dictate to us how much we could afford to spend if we didn't have it. You do have those things present now. And I'd sure like to see this council maybe lead an example for all the councils and all the supervisors to really think, what can we do? Okay, maybe there was or wasn't a mistake, but how do we really address this going forward? Not just kind of give it lip service, let everybody else do it, but kind of like as Gary stood up and really tried to defend our museum, this is that opportunity all four of you can make that same impact, and I would love to encourage it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Close public and return for comment, uh, further observation, uh, Mr. Coffano. I, I only heard one point that um, I feel the need to comment on, but if you've heard others, I, I'm happy to uh, address them. The, as you can imagine, there's a lot of case law that distinguishes when any particular shall in any particular law is mandatory, meaning there's a penalty for not um, doing it, and when it's directory, meaning there isn't. There's two parts to the test. There's the remedy or not, which is the test that I have spoken most about tonight, because it lends itself to the least argument. There's either a remedy provided or there isn't. The other part of the test is, is the duty sufficiently central to the whole statute that we must have understood the legislature to have wanted judicial enforcement, even absent the statement of a remedy. The problem with that half of the test is it's never applied independently of the remedy test, and it's completely arguable. We heard somebody say that the two weeks notice to the public was the whole point of the statute. With respect to that gentleman, I don't think so. I think it was a point of the statute, but having an actuary report in your hands when you're making decisions strikes me as at least equally important. Making sure you're well advised is at least equally important as making sure that the advice you have is shared with the community you serve. So you, when you get into what's more important than another, you end up with endlessly value-laden opinions, and you don't get to the kinds of conclusions that judges can say, yeah, there's more here than there. So I choose to emphasize the remedy portion of the test because the other half of the test never seems to resolve the debate. But those are the two prongs of the test. But I stand by my conclusion that this is not a mandatory duty. And even if it were, there's certain bells you can't unring. The, the, the literal force of the argument that was made in Pacific Grove that I think is implied in your grand jury's report is that you should get money back from your retirees that you should somehow compel people to cut you a check. People who did their duty to the city, retired under the rules as they understood them, and are providing for their families on that assumption. The force of this argument is they should pay us money back. That might make a better balance going forward for the, for the taxpayers in terms of their benefits and burdens from government, but I would submit to you there's not a court in this state that will ever do it. And, and thank you for that observation. Uh, you, you answered uh, uh, a question that was on my mind, and that is, um, in context with other jurisdictions, uh, I find it rather curious, quite frankly, that there were four uh, that were uh, cited in the grand jury report uh, that were overseen by M. Sarah or involved with M. Sarah. Uh, I'm not familiar. I am familiar with a couple, but not certainly not all. Uh, other similar situations uh, throughout the state. You made reference to uh, this, this not being a unique feature of, of our particular city. And I think I understood you to say that there were no situations, and, and I don't know of any, but no situations similar to ours where the, uh, the courts or other mechanisms resulted in some rolling back, if you will, of, of benefits or um, recalculation of the benefits that were granted. Is that correct? That's right. Just an observation, just out of curiosity, quite frankly, more than anything, I'm, I am curious as to why um, 
why none of the, in this case the four, none were apparently aware, and I can only speak on behalf of San Rafael because I was involved in that time, and certainly I was not aware, and I think it's fair to say, I know that it's fair to say, quite frankly, that none of the city council members were well aware of 7507 and the provisions uh, thereof. Certainly there was no debate about, well, let's keep this a secret. On the contrary, uh, we're pretty open about this stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm curious as to why uh, there were similar um, failings by the others. Is there any, any reason for that that can satisfy my curiosity? This is educated speculation because I wasn't there and, and, and I can't know. I accept but, it as that. But my impression is that the culture around employment relations and labor bargaining is more lawyerly now than it was then. Mm -hmm. And there are more lawyers checking codes and confirming compliance than was true then. In that time, these processes were driven a little more strongly by your HR director and your finance manager, and there wasn't anybody checking. And I don't think that was unique to this organization. I think it was a broader description about how our society treated these issues. And we have come to our very expensive regret to wish we had done it differently as a culture than we did. The legislature led us down this path, and s most of us followed, and all of us now regret it. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Um, questions? Um, if I could ask, sure. um, I'm not sure, Mr. Colantano, if you're the person to ask or if perhaps Jack Nixon, the uh, former grand jury foreman, poor person, is the person to ask. But there was a reference to extending the time frame within which we must respond and that it's a fairly simple procedure. Are you familiar with that procedure? Grand juries are relatively informal. They do use official letterhead and they have a judge that supervises them, but they engage in dialogue with the communities that they inspect. So it doesn't surprise me that you could ask for more time. I don't know how quickly they could respond to such a request. I don't know what their meeting schedule in this county is. And I don't know uh, whether you would put yourself in a position of having either a technical foul by being late, um, which, again, I think is going to be directory and not mandatory, um, and uh, whether you, you wish to, to be in the position of having to call a meeting on, on short order. But there's certainly room to have that dialogue if the city council feels that you will benefit from that dialogue. And I would ask Mr. Nixon if you'd care to comment. Good evening, Jack. Uh, I'm now the Jack Nixon, the ex-foreman of the grand jury, as of June 30th. Uh, the law says that you have 90 days to respond. There is also a provision that says you can go a total of six months with a request for an extension. And I presume it means give a good reason, but but it is there that you can do that. Right. I'm curious, if Jack, uh, you said you were the X, and I know that your term has expired, and thanks for the service you provided in the input on this issue as well as others. Uh, I'm curious uh, if there was a delay and then we respond to a new jury, if that, I guess we're going to do that anyway, but mm -hmm. further muddies the water, if you will. I wouldn't say that it muddies the water, Mr. Mayor, but it is a flaw in the system in that you have a 12-month grand jury that gets their reports out near the end of the year, right. and it always goes over into the following grand jury. If the following grand jury has a good continuity committee that logs this stuff and checks the responses to make sure they are done properly, we're okay. And that's how it works. Thank you. Thank and the responses are all posted on the website Correct. as well. Correct. Okay. Thank, thank, thanks. You bet. Any, any uh, further comments or questions with regard to this issue? I have just a few here. If, if I may. Um, sure. Are we at a point before we're going to move? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I want to make sure. Uh, my, my take on this is that, you know, in the findings, the – I disagree with our findings on or our response on findings F1 um, and F5. Um, I believe that we need to not parse words here and basically say that we weren't compliant. Uh, we didn't follow the instructions that were given. Whether or not shall meant 
or there would be any punishment for that. We just didn't do it. So to come back to the grand jury and say we disagree with their findings, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that. On six, F6, I actually agree with, with the findings that um, we disagree. That I believe that the contracts that were negotiated in those, in those times were negotiated in good faith between both parties. I don't think there was any ill intent to hide any information, to hold back any information from the public. I just think that the city at that time didn't do what they should have done and didn't really know that they should have done something different. Um, they, as the mayor pointed out, 7507, and as you pointed out, was not really talked about a lot then. So that it wasn't something that was brought to the attention in my research. I did find that one of the negotiations in 2006, there was um, one representative that spoke during the agenda to call it out from the um, consent calendar to discuss the fact that the, the reports had not been made available at the time. And that was discussed during that piece. Nobody else spoke during it during that time. And the, um, the council approved it, um, that resolution. So in response to F6, I agree with, with your response that we disagree that, that the, um, that the had been statutory violations and the future pension benefits provided with the enhancements may or not have vested rights of the public employees under California law. So I don't, I don't think that that's the case. I, I agree with that. But the other two, I think we just need to step up and say, you know, let's not try and parse words here. Let's, let's be, do what we did. We didn't follow the code as according to what it said, regardless of how somebody interprets it and saying we might have had to. But um, that's just my opinion on it. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, a a follow-up question. Sure. Um, I'm looking at um, F5. F5. And if I have the right, does it start if the pension increases were not made? Is, it, is that what we're talking about? Yep. And we disagree with that. Well, as, a, as you, if you parse those words, these are all more conclusions. You know, if pension increases are not made in accordance with the California government, we found the citizens were never given proper notice. Well, that's... That's a conclusion. Um, these increases in associated liabilities are a contributing factor to why MCERA has a collective unfunded liability of approximately $536.8 million. That's a factual statement that follows from the preceding conclusion. So uh, and neither of which say anything about whether or not San Rafael had defective compliance with was it 5707? No, 7507. 7507. So I'm not, I, I, I agree with the statement that there were defects in compliance. I'm not sure that in a response disagreeing with F5, that's where you would say it. Hmm. So I. I, 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 I guess, I, in retrospect, I don't like our response to F5 because I don't think it really is responding to it, to closely to exactly the words that, were, that are there. It's an if-then statement followed by a factual statement that, that follows from it. So I, I don't know if we can change that to say something like, to the extent this suggests that San Rafael complied fully with the statute or, d or did not comply fully with the statute, then we agree. But I don't know how, how we could go any fur go further. But I, I don't know that those words are, are, are there on the page. I guess I, I'm not sure how we can respond crisply to F5. Well, it might be difficult in this setting to create okay. a response. All right. Yeah, I, Andrew. Well, I, I share some of uh, Mary Beth's concern about F5. Mm -hmm. If I were to put my lawyer hat on, put my litigator lawyer hat on, I would say that the question in some ways can't be answered in the way that we've attempted to answer it because it's um, – both compound and argumentative. And unless we kind of separate out the issues there and address them point by point, we're not doing it justice. But I, my, my larger concern here, um, and I'll tell you my inclination is with some misgiving to go ahead and accept the uh, staff's recommendation. 
Um, my larger concern here is that I don't believe that our response um, is a frank enough acknowledgement of the fact that we made mistakes uh, 10 plus years ago, nine plus years ago. Uh, I think we're forced into replying the way we're replying uh, because of the structure of the grand jury, <coughs> excuse me, analysis report and findings and the way in which we've chosen to address this is to retain counsel to ensure the greatest degree of objectivity. Counsel has provided us with a report that guides our response. The response was prepared in accordance with that report. And frankly, it's very much a lawyer's response. I think that, I genuinely do think that we substantially complied. But does that mean we met our obligation as stewards of the public trust in the fullest sense? I don't think it does. And I think there's a franker way of saying it than the way we have. But I don't know that really this is the opportunity to attempt to parse it and rewrite it. That's which is why I was intrigued by this notion that why don't we um, get an extension to the grand jury and really spend some more time on this. <coughs> My difficulty with that is uh, to what end? I mean, if it's not going to change fundamentally the nature of the response, then is there anything to be gained by a six-month period of self-flagellation? I'm not sure that there is. I think we can do it right now by saying, hey, we messed up, and we did mess up. There's no question about it. But are we going to unwind benefits that we've uh, provided to uh, our employees? I don't see any legal basis for it, and I've read Margaret uh, Thune's uh, letter as carefully as I can, and I've analyzed it as closely as I can, not being a municipal lawyer, um, or at least not currently being one, and I'm, I'm not persuaded by it. So that's my conclusion here, although, again, I share some of the concerns of Mr. Gamblin and Mary Beth to the extent that you've explained your reservations about F5. I, I agree with them, too. I'm j I just don't see a different, a materially, substantially different response than the one that's been recommended to us by staff. If I might, I can offer a sentence in place of the second sentence of your response to F5 that might abridge the discussion you've had thus far. And if it's not helpful, um, so be it. The city's compliance with Government Code Section 7507 had those defects noted, noted in the attached memo. However, the city is advised by independent counsel that these defects do not allow the city to revisit its contractual commitments to its employees and retirees. So you say it's defective, the defects are listed in my memo, and you say, but we can't do anything about that. That's certainly more appealing as a response. I would support that sentence as well. Another idea to offer um, for consideration, mm -hmm. we could write a cover letter on um, being more um, forthcoming and saying what we think our commitment is to our constituents and what um, the city of San Rafael is doing now and will be doing on a going forward basis. And, and admitting that in the past that we had defects in compliance and going forward we're, we're uh, committed to getting all the facts out to all of our constituents as early as, as possible. And we could put that in a cover letter. You know, we could, but to a large degree, I think they're in the recommendation responses. Okay. Right. I do, I do um, too. I yeah. do like the uh, recommendation or the suggestion at this point uh, that has been offered with regard to five, uh, excuse me, F5. Any other comments, questions, issues? May I just be clear on the response to F5 then, if that sentence were to be included? Is it being suggested that a sentence be deleted? Yeah, this is in yeah. lieu of the second lieu. sentence. Okay, so the sentence says the city complied substantially would be deleted. Got it. And then does everyone, will be part of incorporated as part of the motion, but is everyone clear as to how that will be presented? No. Okay, good, good. I'm pleased that we, um, we retained your, um, the outside counsel, I, I, I applaud our city attorney for the recommendation made both the recommendation to do so and then with the um, the parties involved because I've read, uh, I've read virtually everything that's, that's come through and uh, I greatly appreciate clarification. While I sat through this issue, uh, I do know that firsthand that um, one, we didn't address the issue, uh, not asking for forgiveness, but uh, we quite frankly weren't aware of it. and. Um, I can assure you that that's the case. It wasn't meant for any other reason uh, uh, not to involve the community. On the, on the contrary, I think we do everything we can around here to involve the community because we, we can make better decisions by doing so, and that's, that's our stature. 
in our status, and, and um, we will continue to do so. Um, it doesn't excuse, but I, I concur that uh, if we step back and look at the big picture and the obligation and the commitments that uh, we've made, and I feel pretty strongly about making a commitment, and if we, if we do so, we stand by that regardless. Um, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to, to do so as a city. A lot of people have relied upon this for a long period of time in good faith, and um, I certainly, for one, would not feel good about, uh, on the contrary, about um, reneging, if you will, on, on commitments made. That's just not where I'm at, and I, I suspect the council and the city is, a, is in entirety for the services provided by, by those, uh, uh, particularly public safety, uh, but certainly all employees in the, in, the, in the city. I say particularly because if you look at our public opinion surveys, both uh, public safety and as well as other services provided by the city and in their entirety are uh, greatly appreciated. And quite frankly, it's hard to measure what the consequence would have been if we had not provided the, the benefits. Uh, that doesn't come up and it can't quantify it, but I can assure you that they, they would have been different. So I appreciate uh, your, not only your written report, which I thought was quite readable and understandable and, and for, for a non-attorney, if you will, but your explanation I, I found uh, most enlightening as well. So I thank you. I thank you for that. Mr. Mayor? Yes. If I could just append on to sure. what you said. I, I'm, I'm leaving aside how we individually may feel about a commitment that was made, and I, I don't disagree with your remarks, but what compels me here is that we have to repose trust in, in the – we don't have to, but we, we've paid for legal opinion. We have – I believe, a collective degree of respect for the legal opinion that's been given to us, and we're hearing in no uncertain terms that legally it would be indefensible to unwind the obligations that have been promised, excuse me, regardless of uh, technical noncompliance, however that may be phrased. Ultimately, that's what compels me. I may feel like I want to or don't want to provide these continuing benefits to uh, employees, but what compels me here now is the fact that we have a legal opinion that tells us we can't unwind it. So I, I, I just don't see any way around it. Uh, and that's fundamentally, I think, what uh, the grand jury is getting at here, is the compliance, the noncompliance to such a degree that it invalidates the promises that were made. And I'm hearing the answer is no. And I believe that that should be our answer as a body as well. Thank you. Any other comments before we go yeah, to one, uh, motions? Go one on. last thing. Sure. Um, this is obviously difficult for all of us. Um, Maybe some more than others, but uh, I want to make it known that I agree with our responses, that we've done a good job going forward. I think that all the responses that are written in the staff report are, are right on, that Santa Fe takes this very seriously, and that going forward, um, we're going to make sure that, n that something like this never happens again. Um, I disagree, again, with the our responses to the um, grand jury the first two, the last one I agree with. But uh, so the contracts we entered into, like I said, were in good faith. I don't believe that there is any legal standing based upon the opinion that those would be overturned. Um, and so I agree with that finding. That being said, I, I can't vote to approve that piece. So I will not. Okay. Then uh, if there's no further comment, the motion would be appropriate with regard to this item. Well, I would move that we approve the resolution uh, subject to the revision to F5 as discussed. Mm -hmm. Second. You concluded? Yes. Okay, sorry. It's been moved, second. The roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy? Aye. Councilmember Gamlin? No. Councilmember McCullough? Aye. Mayor Phillips? Aye. Matter carries 4 0. Oh, excuse me, 3 <laughs> 1. <laughs> one. I'm, old habits are hard to break. Uh, Jack, do you have something to add? Uh, we've, we've covered this matter, but. I just want to say that the difference between this meeting and what happened at the Board of Supervisors last Tuesday is like night and day. And you're to be complimented for doing such an admirable job of studying what the issue is and reasonably approaching it with a fair-minded, even-handed manner. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That means a lot to us. Thank, thanks to everybody that participated. We certainly appreciate Thank it. Thank you. We'll move on to item uh, four.
4B, resolution authorizes the city manager to enter in an agreement for services of the downtown streets team. Stephanie, I guess that's you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm delighted to be bringing you tonight the third year of a contract with the Downtown Streets Team. The Downtown Streets Team provides employment services um, to our homeless residents of Marin and also um, street cleaning to street cleaning of our streets and garages um, for the City of San Rafael. Um, so far to date, uh, 44 individuals from the Downtown Streets Team have found employment and they've logged over 28,000 hours of cleaning in our downtown. The contract between the downtown streets team and the city sets forth the requirements that we will have for the downtown streets team, and that has increased every year of the contract. So this year the requirement is that there be a 20-member team and 20 people find employment through the downtown streets team, uh, find permanent employment through the downtown streets team. Um, the metrics, uh, as set forth in the staff report, the total contract amount that we're proposing for this year is $172,000, although we anticipate the actual city cost will be $102,000 because we anticipate getting some contributions from others, including health care healthcare organizations and the Marine Community Foundation. Um, but again, the total, um, what you have before you tonight is for the total amount, approving the total amount of the full $172,000. Um, you also have a letter before you from the BID, from the Business Improvement District, who could not be here tonight, um, laying out their support for the team and also reminding uh, staff and the council that we uh, forgot something in the staff report, which was to put in their financial contribution. Um, both the chamber and the BID have made substantial financial contributions to the downtown streets team, uh, as well as in-kind contributions to show their support. Um, so the BID wanted to make sure that we recognize that, and, and we do. So that's all I have. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Just technic um, more of a technical question. I'm not sure I understood the reference in the staff report to the separate contract that the county's entering into. Is it literally just that, meaning they're contributing 100000 but it's under the auspices of a different document? Or is there a different program, or are they somehow bifurcating this, the current program? So in the past, we've had a, the city of San Rafael has had a $272,000 contract with the Downtown Streets team for the first two years. And there was a contract between the city of San Rafael and the county for these services subcontracted through the Downtown Streets team. So we had a contract with the county. So we're breaking that. The Downtown Streets team will have an individual contract with the county for $100,000, and therefore we've reduced our total contract to 172 from 272. So we have met with the Downtown Streets team and expressed our concern and um, that the team be very much San Rafael focused, um, and they have assured us that they will continue to be San Rafael focused, although under the county contract, they probably will be doing some work in other areas, including Novato. Just to add maybe a little bit to that, um, the concept, uh, we've had earlier discussions with the downtown streets team, and their concept has changed a little bit, not fully integrated at this point in time, but the concept was for the county to provide for a lot of the overhead, I'll call it, and um, and then to branch out to various other communities, perhaps Novato, South Salido, and any others interested, and that each of those branches would have a program that, such as you see on the streets, and so the direct, if you will, and the cost associated with that, vouchers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the individual cities would pay for those. And that, that model makes some sense to me. This is a, sort of an interim step. This is step one, to establish that the county, which has contributed 100000 in the past, will continue to do so, but it will be slightly different configured. We will still see the same service that we have, virtually the same service that we have in the past. Uh, some of the amounts may vary a little bit. I, I, for one, think that the City of San Rafael, because of a commitment that was made to the county that equalized uh, the contribution over the prior years, uh, that might change a little bit, um, but certainly not to exceed this 172, certainly to be less, significantly less than that. So it's, it's a little bit in a state of flux as, you, as it evolves. I sort of like the model. I do, uh, for the reasons cited. So that's, that's a little more, perhaps, as to how this thing's evolving. And we've encouraged them to, uh, and did at the outset, 
to provide the same service as needed and, and desired by the various other communities. It's not just San Rafael monopolizing, but certainly we want to make, sh make sure we get the same service. Uh, that's why we have this one-on-one -on -one contract with them. So anyway, there you go. Uh, yeah, Anything else? Well, if I could just ask sure. Stephanie, uh, I, if it was in the sta if it was in the downtown streets team's report this year or last year, I missed it. But does the downtown streets team uh, do they have as part of their philosophy to do a um, kind of a retrospective study a certain number of years out to determine how lasting was the effect of the uh, training and the job placement? Or put another way, what's the recidivism rate for those people who have been lifted up out of the streets mm -hmm. despite their participation with the streets team? Mm -hmm. So the downtown streets team has a limit, of, has a two-year limit for all of their participants. So at the end of two years, you need to graduate out of the program. Um, they do do a self-sufficiency survey for every member of the team every six months. Um, and as I understand it from the Palo Alto organization, people do come back and check in with them. Um, I'm not sure how much further than beyond the two years they're actually looking at recidivism, but they, they do have people who come back to the team, but right now when they say we have permanent employment, that permanent employment is for a minimum of six months. That's how they define permanent employment. It's not a bad idea, though, yeah. in terms of follow-up. I mean, they're yeah. trying to build their history, yeah. and I think it's a good suggestion yeah. that way. Right, but let's call it something more like a longitudinal study or something like that. Right? Something <laughs> that nobody understands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Sorry, wrong word. Right. <laughs> uh, anything else with regard to this item? Any other questions? Then let's. Uh, we could I have a motion with regard to this resolution. I move. So move. Is there any public comment on this? Oh, item? oh I'm Mr. Mayor. Public comment. My sixth sense tells me no. <laughs> but I'm glad it's it was your sense. Uh, uh, your motion with regard to resolution, please. I'll move. Moved and no. second. Moved and, and third. <laughs> Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. And that matter carries 4 0. We'll now turn to, uh, thanks, Stephen. We'll now turn to the city's manager's report. I, I don't have a report tonight. Thank you. Can I say something to the city manager? Sure. Since I will not be here for your last meeting oh. in two weeks, I will be on vacation. I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, helping me get integrated into this fine group here. Um, you took me on my first trip to up to, San, to Sacramento to see what it was like, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually sad that we won't get to work longer. I'm happy to be able to work with Jim, my, my fellow 1968er, but um, uh, it was great working with you. I thank wish you, you well. so much, John. Thanks. Good, and we'll certainly have more comments yeah. along that line uh, uh, at a later date. City manager, uh, city council members reports. Anything? Uh, if I could comment very briefly on the meeting that we had this afternoon. Yes, um, please. As many of you know, there's been uh, uh, concern from folks along Point San Pedro Road about um, uh, a number of things safety related, but we had a meeting this afternoon with various stakeholders in the community and members of City staff, including our police department and public works, were there to talk about some of the ways in which we might address uh, roadway safety going forward. There emerged a consensus at that meeting that something that has been in the planning stages for some time needs to be pushed forward with greater urgency, and that is to take the results of a speed survey that's been done, combine it with outreach and education to the community, and um, move forward with posting a new increased uh, speed limit. Uh, on the city sections of Point San Pedro Road, um, thereby allowing the police department to enforce the newly posted speed limit using radar and LIDAR, which are the effective tools for their enforcement. Um, it was an encouraging meeting because it looks like the community, with the assistance of uh, uh, various stakeholders, were going to get the community behind us. This is a hard matter for a lot of people who live in East San Rafael or who live anywhere to understand that by increasing the speed limit, we actually reduce the um, rate of speed by the people who pose the greatest threat uh, on the roadway um, by means of more visible and consistent enforcement. So I'm looking ahead to continue that process, working with the county on it, working with staff here and, and all of the stakeholders so that we see change out on Point San Pedro Road in this important respect. Good, and, and thanks for uh, bringing that group together. Thanks, thanks for addressing that in a meaningful way. And we'll hear more about it, certainly from staff. Um, let's move on to successor. I won't add anything. Santa Fe successor agency, nothing under it, and therefore we shall, 
shall adjourn to a uh, closed session regarding conference of legal counsel, anticipated lit litigation. Mayor, I think you were going to adjourn in someone's memory tonight. Yes, thanks so much. That of uh, Jake Hours. Jake Hours uh, served admirably uh, to the city for, for a number of years. I knew Jake, as did uh, certainly Nancy, even more so than I. Uh, great guy, good to go work with, and also a fellow council member uh, in Santa Rosa. So uh, it's uh, with a with degree of sour that we, we so close in memory of Jake Hours. Thank you.